Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. This is Ian. Ian, Stan, I'm doing the podcast intro. Are you up to play along here? Yeah, it's two fifteen. I haven't eaten lunch yet. I'm, I'm laying on my back <laughs> in the middle of my living room. All right. Well, I'm gonna do the podcast intro, and I want you to judge me on my proficiency here. Okay. One of the things we talk about all the time on this show is these hot spots that people gravitate towards around the world in the location independent world. You know, if you can do your business and live anywhere. And all of a sudden, you start to think about places in a different way. So on this show, we've talked a lot about like Chiang Mai in Thailand, Davao in the Philippines, Barcelona in Spain, Medellin in Colombia, and Austin in Texas. I think that's where I'm reaching you today. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I'm in Austin. What's the scene like there? What's going on with the location independence scene in Austin? So there's a couple of reasons why I'm here. Maybe this will answer part of your question. Previously, my headquarters or home base was in California. But I did tons of travel outside of California. But that just seemed to be not a very sustainable home base. It wasn't strategic in terms of taxes, honestly. It was an awful decision. Probably, honestly, one of the worst business decisions I ever made in my life was incorporating a business in California <laughs> and becoming a resident of California. It was an absolutely awful decision. And you see a lot of other entrepreneurs, especially highly visible entrepreneurs. I don't need to name them. I'm sure if you're paying attention to them, you'll know who I'm talking about. Many of these people have moved to Puerto Rico and other jurisdictions with lower tax rates. So there's that on my side of the spectrum, like part of the reason why I'm in Austin. The other part of the reason why I'm in Austin, well, there's two reasons. One is because I'm 30 minutes away from a private racetrack, which is very important to me. <laughs> and then the other reason is because I think it's probably the highest density of entrepreneurs doing interesting things that are accessible. You're going to go down to the park today and throw Frisbee around with a lot of really cool people. And I think if you interviewed them, they wouldn't say we're here because of taxes. Uh, no, I know. I think that that's probably unique to my situation. But one of the other things that I'll say about California is, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs kicking around in California, but most of those entrepreneurs were busy. And one of the things that I noticed that's unique about Austin, which I instantly recognize when you're on the road in places like Chiang Mai or places like Vietnam, is that you find yourself very isolated in these communities, especially when I was over in Vietnam. You know, I don't speak the language or anything like that. So when I see another Westerner or I see someone else that speaks English and they're working on their laptop, we have an instant bond. You know, we're in this foreign country together, but we have this thing that we have in common, which is that we work online. In most of the cities in the United States, I think that that's lost because people get busy with friends and family and other obligations. I think Austin is unique in that everyone still recognizes that the person sitting across the table from them in a cafe on a Wednesday afternoon that doesn't have a traditional job is unique. And they're probably worth talking to. And so in that respect, I made a lot of friends in Austin and built a lot of relationships here that I didn't think were really possible to build in the United States. I didn't think that it worked like this until I moved to Austin, that these people still do have time to meet up and to share ideas, although they are still in the United States. I saw that you're hosting a Junto this evening down in Zilker Park. Yeah. So for those that don't know, the third Thursday at 7 p.m. all around the world in like 20 countries, DCers, which are members of the Dynamite Circle, they come together and they hang out together. I'm actually going to one in New York. I got to get off the phone with you pretty soon. You got to go down to Zilker Park. Yeah, I'm going to go down actually a little bit early today so we can make the most out of the sun. But uh, yeah, I do think that's one of the interesting things about our community is that people actually fly to locations where there are other DCers just for these meetups on the third Thursday of the month, which is pretty cool. So there's a lot of cool reasons that people go to Austin. It's interesting that you brought up the taxes thing because I'm going to get on with the rest of the introduction to this episode right now. And I want you to hang on the phone here while I do this. So in our community, a lot of people move around for lifestyle and for social networks, like you were mentioning. But traditionally, business owners have moved to places that are in low or zero tax environments or in otherwise business-friendly environments. So we can all like brainstorm those sorts of places, like the British Virgin Islands is an example of that. And in today's show, two of our listeners are going to share their experiences of living in a couple of others. And those are Panama 
and Andorra. Before we get uh, Boss Man's blood pressure up here, what we're about to say on this episode is no kind of legal advice or anything like that, and it shouldn't be treated as such. These are just thoughts and impressions of interesting entrepreneurs who moved to interesting places. So I'm going to get on with my work here at the podcast, Ian. I'm going to make myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because that's what (laughs) I've been reduced to these days for lunch. All right. So first up is Jace Rodley, who is a digital marketer originally from Adelaide in Australia. Jace and his wife, Jess, visited Andorra about 18 months ago. They liked it so much that they decided to stay. And just for clarity, in this interview, Jace is going to mention the term SaaS, which is software as a service. And he's also going to mention DCers a few times, which is the members of the Dynamite Circle. So let's get started. Jace and Jess's longish journey to Andorra, and I think pretty much any way you slice it, it's a decently long journey, (laughs) did not actually begin there or even in Europe for that matter, but with a formative experience on the wide open slopes of a North American ski resort. For a short while, we lived in a town in British Columbia, Canada called Whistler. Uh, and it's a ski resort and there's also a, a massive mountain bike park. It's the place in the world to be if you want to go mountain biking. We were living there and really very happily living there. It's an amazing town to be in if you like outdoor sports. Were you guys like ski bums at the time? I'm trying to set the context. Yeah, I mean, I would say bike bums. <laughs> We're definitely there for the mountain biking over the skiing, but the skiing is, you know, when it snows for half of the year, that's what you do. And I was working for the IT department for the mountain. A group of us were up at a restaurant or like a cafe at the top of the mountain, and we were able to hang out there after the mountain had closed, after everyone had left. So a pretty privileged thing to be able to do. There was a photo shoot going on. There was right off the absolute peak of the mountain. There was a skier that was... uh, He'd come right off the top and there was a guy shooting him as he came down. So that was cool to watch. And everyone was leaving for the day. And we're up, I forget how high it was, probably like 2,000 metres above sea level, basically up in the clouds. It's kind of funny coming from Adelaide where it's, it's very flat to then come up into the mountains and be so high off the ground and to kind of have all this enormous, massive space. Yeah, it was a very cool moment just to realize like there's more to life than than just work. You know, these experiences just, they can really blow you away. So when you say formative, how do you feel like your direction changed after that realization? After that moment, we did end up going back to Australia. We went back to our previous jobs. My wife was a primary school teacher. I worked for the government in IT. We both had really good jobs. Maybe we knew there was a different way, but we hadn't quite discovered what that way was yet. So we fell back into our old lives. And as the time went on, we just knew it wasn't right. Something didn't fit. I guess we got to breaking point and then we were just like, screw it, we got to go. You said reality bit hard. Yeah, absolutely. So I got married in 2010 to my wife, Jess. We had a block of land in the Adelaide Hills. We were going to build a house on that land. We were going to have a family. We were going to live happily ever after all that. And our honeymoon was three months of backpacking and then a year's working holiday in Canada. And so we both came back to Australia. It felt as though it should feel right going back to Australia, but it didn't. You were going back to that old life. But in the meantime, you'd learnt that there's all these crazy experiences out there. There's all these amazing people that speak different languages and live in different ways. And you know, there's all this fun mountain biking to do. I mean, Adelaide's got trails, but you know, there's exploring to do, you know. I didn't know what Andorra really was a year ago. You mentioned a lot of people ask you why are you living in Africa. What is Andorra? Andorra is a principality. So Andorra is a small country in between Spain and France in the Pyrenees Mountains. And by small, you mean, like, can you walk across it? Well, so that's actually our plan for this summer is to hike around Andorra. And it's about 80 kilometers. So it's a relatively small place. Like you could drive from side to side and and how long? Given no traffic, I would think you could drive from one side to the other in maybe an hour. And visually, how does it appear to visitors? If you didn't know how small it was, you wouldn't probably think it's that small. But visually, people might feel it's very closed in. There's a whole lot of valleys. The villages and the city tend to be in valleys. 
and there's usually mountains on either side. So for people not used to mountains, I mean, I personally love it, but I know some people here that have lived here their whole lives, they feel closed in and they have to escape from time to time. Who are the people that live in Andorra? I would say a pretty big mix. Obviously, Andorran people, they make up quite a small part of the population. So it's claimed that there's 70,000 people in Andorra and there are apparently 5,000 Andorrans out of that 70,000. Wow. So the rest are expats of some sort and I would say the bulk are probably Spanish and French and then you also have quite a few Portuguese and then you have expats from all over the place. So probably more British and there seems to be a fair amount of Russian people coming in here and then you just meet randoms like me. This week's episode is sponsored by AppSumo.com. Sign up today at AppSumo.com slash TMBA and receive a free copy of Derek Sivers' video course called Finding Your Passion and Making Money With It. It's the story of how Derek built and sold CD Baby for $22 million. We asked the AppSumo guys, hey, can we give that to TMBA listeners? They said, sure thing. And if you go to that registration link, AppSumo.com slash TMBA, you also get access to two documents designed to help you with ideas for your next business move, whether that's generating new traffic or validating your next product idea. See, AppSumo's emails go out to nearly 1 million people weekly, and they leverage that extensive reach to get great deals on behalf of their subscribers. Previous deals included discounts of up to 90% on products that entrepreneurs love, like Dropbox, Evernote, and Wistia. And they often give away popular books absolutely free. You can receive your free gifts, including that Derek Sivers video course, and start getting access to deals today. Check it all out at appsumo.com slash TMBA. Can you describe to me how you guys first found yourself there? Like, what was the story? Why would you go to such a sort of a strange, small principality in the mountains? Andorra's been on my radar for a long time. There's a World Cup mountain bike race here every year in Val Nord. And so I've known about Andorra for, for quite a while for that reason. So when we left Australia, we were thinking that we'll just go and live in Canada and that will be that. Will be that. We were going to put down roots there. And at the time, residency was getting quite hard. So we thought, well, let's go and check out Panama. It seemed to have a really easy residency program. We'll live there for Canadian winters. And then we'll just pop up to Whistler every year to ride bikes for the summer. We went to Panama and it wasn't really what we were expecting. We found it to be a little bit more expensive than than we thought. And maybe it didn't suit, I guess, the lifestyle we were looking for. And so we just thought, well, let's jump on a plane to Andorra and see if this is even worth checking out. And I think we were here for maybe 24 hours and we decided this is the place. What was it about it that it was so instantly attractive to you? Being back in the mountains feels good for both of us. We're both really drawn to that. But rolling into the, the village that we were had our apartment in that we were renting, there were just mountain bikers everywhere. It was like end of day for mountain biking and there were just bikes everywhere and it just felt like, you know, these are our people. It just felt like home. I guess there's the logical side and that's what I always look at. Before we were looking for a place to put down roots, I was always looking at everything on paper and it was kind of, What's the cost of living like? What's the climate like? You know, is the internet good? Can we make this work? And then you actually get to a place and you think, you know, this is great on paper, but it doesn't work. And, you know, we got here and it was great on paper and we just felt like we were at home. And we still do. What would be like a signature dish or like a sort of an experience, a meal that you might have there in Andorra? Well, that's a pretty tough one. Both my wife and I eat a plant-based diet. So when we first got here, that was actually our biggest hang-up. What are we going to eat? But in one year, three vegetarian-specific places have opened up. There's more and more rolling in all the time. It's almost like that Barcelona influence is, is coming up the Pyrenees, so it's all good for us. But, yeah, I mean, we have horses grazing across the road, and there's no kind of nice way to get around that. Like, they're going to get eaten. <laughs> That's what they're there for. You said, of course, the social factor has made Andorra a practical possibility. What do you mean by that? 
Actually, I've sort of wrote a list of criticisms of Andorra or like a list of realities for, for people because I hate overselling a place. Do you want to start in on it? If you want. Will it help? Yeah, of course. So my number one criticism is that good peanut butter is pretty hard to find. <laughs> but that aside, coming from North America, that's a tough one for me. Andorra's not the sort of country you can just rock up and join the Facebook group and be with 25 other location-independent entrepreneurs that evening, you know? You do have to put the effort in. You do have to discover people. It takes a lot more time. There's a community here. There's people here. There might be people that want to know you, but they're actually back in their home country and they're going to be back in Andorra for the summer. It just takes a little bit longer. So it's not like a robust entrepreneurship scene there, fair to say. I would say there's... As far as self-employed people go, there's probably the percentage of self-employed people in Andorra would be just about the highest in the world, wouldn't surprise me, because that's how a lot of people get their residency. It's just that those people are all in their homes, like me, working from a home office, or they have residency in Andorra, but they don't actually spend any time here. But I want to say, like, there's two different crowds, like, there's these people that are working from their laptop and just going around and they're pumped. It's their first few years going around. That's cool. But like established entrepreneurs and business people want nothing to do with those people, right? They don't want somebody who's just showed up to Barcelona two weeks ago and they're, they just got an apartment. They're going to like go to all the mixers and then they're going to be out in a month. Like if you've got 14 employees, a family, a track record in business, like that is the last person that you want to meet. It sounds to me like what you're describing and Andorra has a lot of reasons why business people would want to be based there. If you want to meet and network with people that have some depth to their business experience, they're not going to be at the, I just got the town meetup. That's sort of how I'm t interpreting what you're saying about the entrepreneurs in Andorra. Well, actually, put it this way. Andorra is also a bit of a transient country. People come and they do a season. I learned this being in, in Whistler in a ski resort. With people coming and going all the time, you don't tend to invest as much in a friendship that might last for two months. You're sort of sussing people out for, well, how long are you going to be here for? And I would say that of the people I've met here, that's also what they're trying to, to pick up on is, is this person a tax resident or is this person like a resident? Do they want to live here? If you're the latter, it changes things. Let's speak a little bit about the benefits of doing business in Andorra. Like, you know, you guys are on the doorstep of two of the most popular countries for expatriates in Europe. Why won't you just move to France or Spain and visit Andorra? Why go direct to Andorra? Well, from my point of view, France and Spain have some economic problems. I would not be interested in residency in either of those countries for that reason. What's that mean? Why would your residency attach you to that problem? Well, it's a good point. I mean, you can run a business elsewhere. Andorra had a really clear residency program for us, and cost of living was great as well. Taxation is quite reasonable in Andorra as well, so tax is 10% here. For people that are looking to buy a house, that type of thing, you know, your property tax is really low. I think your maximum property tax is something like 180 euros a year. So clearly very affordable. Registering a car is quite cheap, registering and insuring a car. So overall, your cost of living is very cheap. Yeah, you were mentioning like really low rent prices. Yeah, so we pay, uh, I think it's like 660 a month, 660 euros a month. I forget the exchange rate, but it's probably about the same in US dollars. For a two-bedroom, two-bathroom apartment with a car park, a storage locker, we're very comfortable on, to us, not a lot of money. The equivalent, we were paying for a similar size place in Whistler in Canada, and it was in nowhere near this same condition. This is much nicer. And we were paying about 2000 Canadian dollars a month for that. It looks to me like, you know, you've gone into great detail about different options people can take in order to achieve active or passive residency in Andorra. And we're going to link to all that stuff. I appreciate you doing that. But on paper, it sure looks easy. Is that fair? Andorra is, I think, quite easy. I'm used to bureaucratic governments. So I'm used to people saying, oh, that's not my job. You know, put it on the pile. We'll get to that. I have a friend that's been trying to get residency in Australia for about 16 months now. And that's normal. We got residency, I think it took about three and a half months. And that could have been much quicker. 
the reason why that got held up, we had a certificate had expired. So I think certificates have all got to be within three months of being printed and certified. And one of them had expired before the time when it got passed in. So we had to get a new one that held things up. Really the main hang up for our residency was starting a company. And once the company is set up and all approved and everything, I think it was about two weeks to get to get residency. And is it beneficial to you to run your business from Andorra? Yeah, I mean, from a tax point of view, it's beneficial. I would say the the main negative about running a business from Andorra is it's a small country. It's not well known. So if you have, I know we have a lot of members in the DC that do like FBA, so fulfillment by Amazon. And I'm pretty confident Amazon won't deposit money into an Andorra bank account just because it's like it's such a small country. Why would they bother going through the process of getting everything approved and getting it all set up? So it's things like that for the tech side of it. It's probably life's a little bit harder in Andorra. For instance, getting a, a phone line set up to work with any type of like SaaS product or like cloud-based phone system. Like you can't get an Andorran phone number for that. It's just not on the list, you know. It's actually a hard place to learn the language. So the official language of Andorra is Catalan, but there is a lot of Spanish spoken here and quite a lot of French. And then you also have a fair bit of Portuguese kicking around. And then there's people like me speaking English. And then you also get some Russian. So, I mean, I'm trying to learn Spanish at the moment. It is tough sometimes. Ultimately, I want to learn Catalan. Everyone says, oh, you know, learn Spanish, learn Spanish. It's, you can use it all around the world. It's kind of tricky to, to learn a language because you'll start a conversation with someone, you realize, hang on, he's speaking French. <laughs> so that can be a tough one. Like if, I think if you're, if you're one of those people that's visiting a place or you want to go and live in a country for a few years to really pick up the language, Andorra might be a tricky place to do it. I'm curious to hear your list of downsides, but there's all different kinds of people with a lot of different flexibility listening to this. Who do you think like might make sense for them to swing through town and to take a look at the country? Yeah, what's your sales pitch for Andorra? Yeah, I mean, to me, Andorra is the right type of place for someone that enjoys the outdoors. In the mornings, we'll, we'll often go skiing. So we might start the work day skiing at nine o'clock. We'll go up to the lifts for a couple of runs and then we'll come down before maybe at 11 we'll finish and, and then start our work day. If you like mountain biking, if you like hiking, there's plenty of lakes up here, that type of thing. Andorra always has festivals and those types of events going on, but I think you also have to be willing to accept what's going on and just attend rather than if people are looking for a, a live event, like a specific band or something, chances are they're not coming here. <laughs> Andorra is the right sort of place if you're going to enjoy it for what it is. My perspective as well is if you if you want some quiet time and you want to get some work done, build a business, Andorra's a great place for that because it, it is fairly quiet. And then the next weekend, there'll be a couple of thousand people roll in for like a free skiing festival that's on or a mountain biking festival or, or the Tour de France will roll through. There's kind of a real up and down in how busy the country is. And to me, the downtime, that's when you work. You hustle like crazy when there's nothing going on. And then when there's an event on, you go and relax and take advantage of it. So let's talk about some of the maybe deal breakers. It sounds pretty appealing. First off, it's worth mentioning, I think, that residency, you're not part of the Schengen area. So if you gain residency to Andorra, you're not going to be able to live full time in Spain, for example. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the, the murky waters of residency here. As I understand it, you're allowed to access the Schengen to come and go from Andorra. That's not a problem. Access through Spain and France, you would never have a problem. But access through other countries, say if I flew from Australia to, I don't know, Germany and then caught a bus to Andorra, I'm not going to get any stamps between Berlin and my home. And so then I fly out of Berlin six months later and they might look at me funny. In theory, there could be, there could be hassles. For us, we spend so much time here that we, it's not a problem. We could always prove that we're, we're in the country. But there are people that try and play games and try and spend less time in Andorra than they should. An example of that might be somebody who gets Andorran residency and then just lives in Spain. Yeah, I think so. Speaking of living in Spain and taking buses, if you want to travel anywhere, you got to get on one, right? Yeah, I mean, we have a car, so we can drive quite easily down to Barcelona or, or wherever. But to... 
lead Andorra, yeah, you're not flying out. I think there is a, a helicopter you can catch down to Barcelona Airport for two and a half grand, but that's <laughs> I'm not quite making that sort of coin yet. What do you have any parting shots that you want to share with the audience? Yeah, I mean something random. I I just thought about. Well, the the way I think about Andorra, Andorra's a highly developed country in a lot of ways, and it's also a country town. Across the road, there's horses grazing. I mean, I have, I think, some of the fastest internet in the world in my house. Everyone here drives a, just about a brand new car. I think it has the highest Porsche Cayenne ownership per capita in the world. And they grow tobacco, like 50 metres from my house is tobacco growing. Tobacco is grown all, all over this country. To me, it's such an interesting country. It's got a lot of history, and yet it's developing very, very fast. Thanks for coming on the show and sharing with us this story. No worries. Thanks for having me. Andorra, I got to say, I learned from Jace, has some of the finest bicycling in the world. And it's a close neighbor to Barcelona. So now I'm almost assured to be making a visit in the coming months. Thanks to Jace for sharing your story. One of the interesting things about them is that originally, you know, they decided not on settling in Andorra, but the very place my next guest has decided to settle, and that's Panama. They thought that Panama was going to be the place for them, but it didn't work out. So in the second half of the show, we're going to talk to somebody who did fall in love with Central America, the tropics, spent some time in Costa Rica, but then found his niche when friends he'd met there encouraged him to check out Panama. My name is Matt Landau here in Panama. I go by any variation of Matt, Max, Math, Mad, <laughs> most simply Mateo. That's a good, like, surefire one. All right, man. So what is the business that you run? Tell me a little bit about what you do. So I have a small boutique hotel here in Casco Viejo, which is the historic district of Panama City. I bought it back in 2006 when it was literally the only place to stay. And I say boutique hotel, but it's actually a, a little fleet of luxury self-appointed vacation rentals. Nice. So each unit has a kitchen and a TV room and daily maid service and all that kind of stuff. But you also have an online business as well. Yeah, the online business actually was kind of like a product of learning all this hospitality thing on the fly. So I began to notice that everything that I had learned the hard way or the expensive way could very simply be presented to folks who were just getting started in the vacation rental little niche. And that kind of evolved into a membership site, which is called VRMB. And it's primarily for the more progressive vacation rental owners and managers who are looking to build a little bit more of a sustainable, independent business than kind of relying on Airbnb or HomeAway or anything like that. Let's talk about your story. You know, you grew up on the East Coast of the U.S. Do you remember the first time you stepped foot in Panama? Yeah, it was right after college. Basically, I spent six months traveling Costa Rica writing a travel book. And we got sponsors for it, and because his agency was really well-connected, I never had to pay. <laughs> this is like 2004. 2005. Okay. That was kind of me getting hooked on the tropics. And everybody in Costa Rica said, Matt, you got to go check out Panama, specifically this historic district of Casco Viejo. Panama, from a business sense, hadn't yet exploded in the way that it has today. So it was still relatively untapped. The real estate boom hadn't started. The tourism industry was pretty much non-existent. So in an opportunist sense, they were like, Panama's for you. Get yourself in the middle of that ecosystem and something positive will happen. But more specifically, Casco Viejo, if you imagine like a New Orleans 100 years ago, <laughs> this was a little tiny 12-block historic district, just gorgeous architecture, French and Spanish inspired, huge amount of potential, but just crackheads everywhere and stray dogs and it was just a mess. But I think what my friends saw in the neighborhood that they associated with me was sort of a bit of empathy, like sensing in a destination what it needs to grow and what can be solved. Casco Viejo also ended up being this incredible community 
element of my life that I simply couldn't live or do business without now. So in hindsight, I think they probably sensed that it was a good place for me to community build. And lastly, it was just a big challenge. And I think I'm the type of person that I like big challenges. I don't like huge challenges, but it was like just enough outside of my little comfort zone that they said I would love it. And I came for a long weekend and I did. Tell me about that long weekend. What was, what was your first impression of Panama? My first impression with Panama was very metropolitan. Compared to any other city in Central America, it is the most cosmopolitan place on the map. Big skyscrapers, very good infrastructure. So that was another nice little pro in the sense that most of the other Central American capitals had really serious infrastructure problems. Diverse, the national Panamanian identity is comprised of like 50 different ethnicities. The lifestyle for the price was incredible. I will follow that up by saying it's not incredible anymore to anyone who's getting like too excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> but it was super cheap. My first apartment cost 350 bucks right. a month. And that exact same apartment, I just passed by it the other day, that exact same apartment with, as far as I can tell, no upgrades is like 1300 And what's now starting to happen is there's a bit of a correction on the real estate market, on the tourism market, because in that boom period, everybody... And their sister built a hotel or an apartment building. And now, guess what? There's too many hotels, too many apartment buildings. The tourism strategy was not sustainable. They chose to focus on all-inclusive resorts and gambling and shopping, which we all know is not a sustainable thing to focus on. It's short-lived. So a lot of the, the growth in Panama that's taken place over the last 10 years is beginning to, I think, test the infrastructure a little bit like traffic is crazy now but that's not to say like I have new friends who come to Panama for the first time now and I think it it's definitely a matter of perspective they're like wow there is tons of opportunity here this is happening and and they're right it is to them I think what most Americans might think about Panama is they think about the economic policies that the country itself has promoted I don't have much prejudice about Panama, I guess. It doesn't have a big brand. Its brand is mostly in my mind about tax incentives for going and setting up a condominium there or something like that. How much of that is the reality and how much of it is just marketing for foreign investment? I would say that the part that you just repeated back to me is good marketing because otherwise you would have never known about that type of incentive. At the same time, I also feel like its geographic location is so strategic. It's almost like too big to fail while it is a tiny isthmus. It's got so many eyes on it, and it's got the Panama Canal, which is connected to the banking district, which is connected to the free zone. It has all these elements that are as bulletproof, I would say, as they come in the terms of today's market conditions. And why is the Panama Canal important? Just not assuming that everybody knows about it. Yeah, it's the world's greatest shortcut. <laughs> That's what my grandma used to call it. It's an incredible pathway between the seas. I'm pretty sure it's one of the modern wonders of the world, actually, that connects the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean. So it like changed the world of trade in a lot of ways. And that precedence, I think, began to trickle down into all those other things that we mentioned. But in the end, Panama, I don't really ever feel like they have done a earnest job of promoting the things in the country that are truly remarkable. They have done a good job of promoting the resorts and the big hotels downtown. But increasingly, that's not what people are looking for. And it's got all these amazing resources in the interior on the coastline that just make living here so gratifying and easy. Most of the things I hear about people moving to Panama are opportunity seekers. And it sounds like you went for an opportunity, but something else kept you there. When you visit certain destinations that speak to you in a certain way, like it's not every destination that can do this, but certain times you just feel a click. And like, I guess you could compare it to falling in love, but I just felt this energy. And a lot of people who have done business in Panama will describe it the same way. You just feel this energy of like positive momentum and things are happening and opportunities are popping up. And I think when a destination 
draws you in that sense, much less artificial, like something is speaking to you. That's kind of what I felt when I first got here, specifically to Casco Viejo. That's what really pulled me in. And when you join a community, a true community, DC is a great example. When you begin participating, when you begin interacting, you can't leave almost. I mean, of course I can leave, and I do, but you've almost got a network of people that are counting on you and vice versa as this lifestyle. And I think in the end, every time that I have left Panama thinking to myself, maybe I'll go spend a year or five years somewhere else, it's that like energy that pulls me back. It's the community. One of the things I always love to share with folks and humbly one of the things that folks are always most intrigued about when they come visit me here is this nonprofit that we launched about four years ago. And in hindsight, I don't think my lifestyle as an online business person could have grown as quickly or as sustainably without it. And it was quite simply recognizing that the neighborhood had some very serious gang issues, recognizing that nobody from the government to any outside influences was doing anything about it, and so that we had to come up with our own solution. And our first very simple, like, toothpicks and bubblegum solution was to put together a gang intervention pilot program, 10 weeks of basic education that those who were raised in gangs never got growing up. And that pilot program grew and yielded results that we could never have guessed. And the following gang came knocking on our door and saying, when is our opportunity to go through the foundations program? And that happened again and again. And we've officially demobilized all four of the gangs and crime is officially in our neighborhood at zero. But in that process, I see some very important learning points for me personally as a businessman, not philanthropically speaking, learning how these guys think, learning how to communicate, learning, and one of the elements in the program is actually entrepreneurship, learning how people with very remedial skills become entrepreneurs, learning how to bring in various stakeholders in the community to help in the cause, community building in general. Those are all things that like daily I ask myself to compare what I'm doing with VRMB with Esperanza, which is the gang program. And I think it's made me a much better business person. And if I could ever recommend one thing to folks who go and move abroad, it would be to get your feet stuck in in some sort of cause or program that you're really passionate about and let that kind of be the fuel that drives your lifestyle and your business. And in the end, for me, it kind of drove my purpose. Tell me about your peer group there. Are there people like you there? Are there young internet entrepreneurs coming to Panama to grow businesses? There are. They certainly are. My peer group is very diverse. I have friends from the States and from abroad who have come to Panama to open online businesses or to operate their online businesses. I have another friend who runs a website building platform for musicians. Age, totally different. Craig is like 76 years old <laughs> and his wife, Betty, and I have more meaningful conversations with them, former school teacher and high school football coach, than I do with a lot of my colleagues in the States now. One second. I think we're just breaking up just a little bit, Matt. I don't know if it's me or you. How's your internet down there? It's a good time to talk about internet speeds. Yeah, it's, it's usually like pretty much bad. Is it bad? Yeah, unfortunately. Why is that? I think part developing world, part lack of demand for good internet. Interestingly enough, online business and the digital lifestyle is not reached Panama en masse yet. So while you can get it, you end up paying a lot for it or you have to use, like I use a very unique internet provider who basically caters exclusively to people like me who need to have Skype. And so you have a dedicated line coming into your home, basically. Yeah. And when it has any issues, I call the owner of the company and I <laughs> ask him to make sure everything's okay. I kind of get a sense in Panama that like if you owned like a gambling website on the internet or like any kind of like high income, like legally difficult business, somehow Panama has a reputation for like a place you can go and enjoy like certain kinds of protections that other places wouldn't be so adept at. Do you have any insight into that? I don't have any insight to that, but it's super accurate. 
a lot of the foreigners that came to Panama in the first five years of that boom that I mentioned were exactly like what you just described. There was the porn sector, the online porn sector, gambling, all those types of, like, as you say, challenging little niches were for some reason attracted here. I would say that they didn't do the reputation of the country a nice thing by kind of branding it as this place where anything goes. Because in, in truth, at the beginning, when I first arrived, anything went. It was very much like the wild, wild west in that sense. But I think those folks began to realize that there was way too much attention. There was way too many things happening here for it to be the place that they kind of like either hide it out or were trying to like get around something logistical about their business. And Panama, I don't know if you saw that leak, the Mossack and Fonseca Panama Papers. It was like a big leak about a year ago in which it was revealed that like Panama's most powerful law firm had actually been opening up all these shell companies and pretty much allowing anything to pass through. And it was leaked. And in their defense, the government has done a really good job of trying to step up their game and be clear about what is available here and what's not and make sure that the right type of people are coming for the right reasons. What are the things that annoy the crap out of you about living in Panama? There's got to be some negative things. Are there deal breakers there that like, do you ever have a friend that you're on the phone and you're like, man, you got to come down to Panama and they come and visit you and they're kind of disappointed in your sales pitch about it? You know, like what are their disappointments that they've expressed with you? So I think that's a good rule for living abroad in general is that there's no real point in complaining. You chose to be there and it just ends up pissing people off and you have signed up for something very clear that is living in that country. Of course, don't get me wrong, I find myself privately with other foreigners just like super frustrated over certain things. Some examples would be the general like efficiency, not unlike most developing worlds, is <laughs> very low. Getting stuff done takes a long time. If you are running a brick and mortar business, a lot of the paperwork and a lot of the hiring and firing and all the operational stuff is quite challenging. What are some other things? Traffic, but you get traffic in most major cities. The general attitude, and this is like a bit more of a philosophical point, but because Panama has always had the Panama Canal and before that the Camino Real, which was basically the canal but people walking, and then the railroad. Because Panama's economy has always been this sort of open up your door, sell something, close your door economy, you don't really sense a whole lot of go get if you know what I mean. The motivation to grow, just general upward mobility is very muted here. That has, in my opinion, some impact on the people that live here and doing business here. It's just, it also creates opportunity. But just in general, like I'm starting to see a whole new wave of entrepreneurs in Panama, primarily Panamanian, who are recognizing that deficiency and filling it in, like in spades. There's a really interesting, blossoming, young entrepreneur scene in Panama. All, well, almost all brick and mortar type things. But they are totally taking advantage of the fact that all of their parents' generation was pretty content, pretty complacent. So I tend to see that as a bit of a challenge or a difficulty. But at the same time, the more that I travel, the more that I find that a lot of people are complacent everywhere. And when I first got to Panama and I heard that you could run from Casco Viejo through a rainforest to an Olympic-sized pool on a former military base where I could swim and then run back as the sun is coming up. Hold on a second. I have to take that phone. Uh, the no door. Now, just to fill you guys in, at this point in our discussion of complacency and the, quote, Central American way was interrupted by some contractors from the roof. He was ringing the door to say, just so you know, we're being quiet now. <laughs> Before you and I got on the call, they were building like a Ferris wheel on the roof. I don't even know how they got up there. <laughs> and it was like drilling. And all of a sudden, I looked out my window and there's a massive like tin panel being lowered by like a guy hanging by a rope. So I was like, can you guys by chance not make noise for the next 
hour. And they, they looked like, <laughs> like they could do it. And then I said I would throw in some beers. And they said, okay, we can do it. The guy who was in charge just came and interrupted us to tell them that they were doing a good job. So what kind of beer are those guys going to drink? And what might they want to eat for their birthday dinner in Panama? They drink one of three beers which are Panamanian brewed, which are almost identical in flavor, which have different labeling, but pretty much nothing else. Panama is the first one. Do you like that name? Say it again. It's called Panama. <laughs> the second one is called Balboa, uh -huh. named after the explorer Vasco Nunez de Balboa. He discovered the Pacific Ocean. And the third one is called Atlas. And they're super cheap. The Panamanians consume more of these beers per capita than almost any country in the world. They're like in the top three. Wow. And interestingly enough, I like your lunch question because in my culture, your special meal is something like extravagant, something that you like haven't had in a long time or something that is like prohibitively expensive. Panamanians love their basics. Like literally, that guy, if you were to give him $100 to go and have a birthday lunch, he would buy $100 of arroz con pollo. <laughs> Chicken and rice, what's not to love? The universal comidas. Thank you so much to Jace Rodley and Matt Landell for sharing stories of the places that they love, that have captured their hearts, and that they have settled in. I just think it's such an amazing opportunity that so many entrepreneurs are exploring the world and uh, finding their unique niches around. And I like this little mini-series where we follow the stories that land interesting people in equally interesting places. Speaking of interesting places, I'm still here in the U.S. of A. and about to uh, head off to that meetup later on tonight. So I'm looking forward to it. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Check it out at tropicalmba.com slash Andorra and Panama. And of course, we'll be back next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Do join us. We look forward to seeing you then. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.